S&P 500 managing to close above a key level today, despite global growth worries still swirling around Wall Street. Let's get to Bob Pisani down at the New York Stock Exchange for the latest. Hey, Bob. Hello, Melissa. You know, this is a very important moment for the markets, potentially. We are finally breaching the 2800 level in the S&P 500. And we've even got a shot at getting over 2820. We got close today. This is where five rallies, look, I've circled them here, have failed in the last six months, in October, in November, in early December, in late February, in early March. So a break above 2820 may drag in more investors because a lot of people are still sitting on the sidelines. Despite the Boeing concerns, the VIX has dropped to 13. That's essentially the lows for the year. Now, one thing might be helping. Friday is a quadruple witching expiration. This is the quarterly expiration of index options and futures and individual stock options and futures. Jeff Hurst from the Stock Traders Almanac has noted that there is a slight upward bias in this week. It's been up 24 times since 1983, and it's only been down 12 times. The key, though, long term, we talk about this all the time, is the global growth outlook. We had good data today with economic news on durable goods and producer prices in the United States, and that may help bulls to argue that earnings may not turn negative for the first and second quarter. Maybe. But to keep the rally going, we need more meat on the bones. That's why investors will be watching key Chinese economic data overnight. I'm talking about retail sales and industrial production. Now, what traders need is better visibility, as I mentioned, on the global growth. Facts that recently pointed out that companies with earnings outside the United States have much lower earnings expectations than companies that have the majority of their earnings inside the United States. And this is the S&P 500, not the Russell. That means that China and Europe need to stabilize to get better visibility on earnings. Elsewhere, Brexit's another mess. The British pound's nearing a two-year high. But what the street wants is for the deadline to be extended and then another referendum that might result in the U.K. remaining in the EU. Back to you, Melissa. All right, Bob. Thank you very much, Bob Bassani at the NYSC. All right, we go to Tim here. Emerging markets still overall the most crowded trade on Wall Street. Yeah, well, and, and it's about time because, I mean, I tell you what, they, they actually have been outperforming now for four or five months. I'm not telling you things are rosy. In fact, China's going to have a bunch of macro data tonight that I think could actually scare people. I mean, retail sales are going to come out. Mm -hmm. If you look where the trend is on this, industrial production, all the main barometers really of real time, um, less, I think, so than the PMIs, which you get, which are a little cloudy. Uh, machine orders last night in Japan were terrible. Um, durable goods here in the States were a little bit better this morning, but that's a choppy number. Look, bottom line is no one's going to be blown away by global PMIs and the global growth dynamics. The question is, did we take the spoke out of the, the, uh, the, the stick out of the spoke and have a place where markets can start to reaccelerate a little bit? My sense is with stimulus abounding around the world, especially in China, I actually, as I've said in the last couple of weeks, I think data has bottomed. All right. Well, our next guest says there are big risks to this market that could put the rally on hold. Let's bring in Joe Zidal, Blackstone's chief investment strategist. Joe, great to have you with us. Thanks. Um, so on the U.S., you're cautious for now. Well, on the U.S., I mean, we're looking at this, this growth slowdown, but I think there's actually a case for optimism here, and that is we are seeing some of these leading indicators showing signs of, of troughing, not only here in the U.S., but in China as well. And you know, we talk about the China data that's coming out this week, but what we've seen over the last couple of weeks are things like business confidence in China starting to improve, uh, new orders actually in China starting to improve as well. So I think what we've experienced here is a bit of a growth slowdown, but my guess is it stabilizes in 2019. And I think one of the big themes for all of 2019 is going to be central bank liquidity, which is a sharp contrast to what we saw in 2018. So I think the good news for markets is this. The idea that we're going to run into a recession, I think, has been pushed off, which gives us another opportunity for, uh, like, call it another profits cycle. So we're running into a profits headwind in 2019 in the first and second quarter, and that's likely to cause markets to, to pause in the short term. But the reality is with this lower growth profile, our, our cycle is extended out, and I think we can get another profit cycle here. So in other words, I think the corporate profit story could actually improve as the year goes on or maybe even to 2020, because right now analysts are pretty negative on corporate profits. For China, that's a place that you're overweight. So we're seeing this, this sort of inflection in terms of the, the data out of China, and at the same time, we're still waiting for the full effect of the stimulus that's already been put into place, not even counting the stimulus that could still be put into place, right? Yeah. So what, what's the upside from here for a market that's, you know, 
up, what, 20 percent, something like that this year? Well, I think the upside is that, you know, you've had almost the equivalent of 2.2 trillion renminbi injected into the market from the People's Bank of China through reserve cuts and things like that. At the same time, you've got the ECB, who's likely to, you know, sort of pivot fully back into easing mode because I think Europe continues to slow. Not only is GDP growth in, in, in Germany and France sort of really weak, but their leading indicators to continue to deteriorate. So I think the upside to the markets in 2019 is global central bank easing. Last year, 56% of central banks hiked rates and the monetary base contracted. The last time that happened was 2011, and 2011 was a really tough year for equity and credit risk assets. So I think the big shift this year is that we do swing back to easing. So U.S. cyclicals, things like energy, materials, technology, they're all two to three or 400 PE points lower than they were in September's peak. So I think as we do get more of that central bank liquidity, even if we pause in the short term, six to 12 months from now, I think we're higher because valuations are more attractive, the 10-year Treasury uh, yield is lower, and we do have this central bank easing. In the short term, it's a tug of war between fundamentals and an earnings problem. So, Jay-Z, let me ask you something. Mainly, I just wanted to say Jay-Z. But also, what do you, where, does it, this, where is China if we don't see a trade deal? I mean, it's all this optimism that's starting, that's not starting, it's really been accelerating. Is that all predicated on a trade deal? I think a lot of it is. And I think if trade deteriorates from here, both the U.S. and China lose. There is no winning a trade war. There is no... A uh, good outcome from a trade war. So I think the big risk to the markets is that this trade war is not resolved. That's risk number one. Risk number two is let's say we resolve the trade conflict with China and then let's say we de decide to turn and engage Europe or European autos. I think that is a, a risk to the markets. Um, and the way that we see it manifest itself is not through the S&P 500 necessarily, but rather I like to look at small business confidence because if the trade does deteriorate from here and we end up in a trade war a worse one with China or one with Europe, what happens is as small business confidence deteriorates, so goes GDP. Small businesses in the United States employ 50% of the private workforce, and if their supply chains are interrupted or if their prices go higher because of various different reasons, and we see that confidence roll over, then take any optimistic forecast and throw it out the window. It's interesting. I thought one of the big stories, obviously Boeing was a big story today, without question, but, you know, the president had this press conference, and, you know, one of the many things he said is he's really no hurry to do a deal with the Chinese, and I think that sort of got lost in, in sort of the, the noise with Boeing, and I was surprised the market didn't sell off more. Now, I've been in the <clears throat> camp that this market's going to roll over here at 2800 and last week I would have looked smart, and here we are right back, and Karen said it for me a couple nights ago. I'll say it again. You know, the fact that the market hangs out here as long as it does, you have to ask yourself, is it giving you that much of an opportunity to sell what has at least been a high for the last couple months? You know, now I'm starting to think, you know, maybe Joe's right. Maybe we do grind a little bit higher here. We'll see. Joe, thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. Jay-Z.